Last week, brethren, we kept the uh, last great day, the final holiday in God's wonderful plan that He uses those days. In fact, the last great day actually has a deep meaning. He does, it does remind us that one day all humans who have never heard and never had opportunity for salvation will come back to life and will live in a totally different world and will have that wonderful opportunity to choose God's way. So there is one particular chapter in the Old Testament that relates to the last great day and every year we basically read that chapter, that's Ezekiel chapter 37. Now that day represents again the last great day, the time when both small and great are going to stand before God in what is called the white, great white throne judgment. It is time when the dead are going to be resurrected and those people then will be able to understand the Bible as we are able to understand the Bible today. They too will have their opportunity to understand God's ways and to be converted. When we come to understand that, brethren, that is the best news we can think of. Something that should fill us with joy all the time. Because today we do preach the good news of the world to come. Well, this is the best news of that good news. Ezekiel 37 is that particular chapter relating to the meaning of the last great day that we kept a week ago. Let us see the context of that chapter. You know, there are many chapters in the Old Testament related to the Gentile nations and their future. What this chapter is really focused on is the house of Israel and the house of Judah, or we might say the house of Jacob. Now, as we know, Ezekiel was a man who was a prophet, but he was a priest, the Bible tells us, and of the family of Zadok, which the family of priesthood remained faithful, you know, to God during the reign of David and Solomon when the other priestly family was not. Now, the last descendant of Eli's priestly line, remember Eli from the story of, of Samuel. So the last you know, descendant of the Eli's priestly line, Abiathar, was deposed by Solomon. Now, that is the line that was not faithful. Ezekiel was taken captive by Babylonians in the year 598 before Christ at the time of the king of Jehoiachin. So about eight or nine years before this, some of the Jews were also taken captive by Babylonians. Now this, that was the first deportation, the first captivity of the Jewish people. And from that time, in the next 19 years, various deportations of Jewish people took place before Jerusalem was finally taken captive and destroyed. Most of the Jewish people, although not all of them, were taken to captivity after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 before Christ. Five years after this captivity of the king Jehoiachin, Ezekiel starts giving his prophecy. In other words, Ezekiel's prophecy began 13 years into the beginning of the captivity of the house of Judah. He started to prophesy five years after being taken captive in 593 before Christ. At that time, apparently, he was 30 years old. Then he continued to prophesy until 569 BC, approximately, or 22 years later. So the whole book of Ezekiel came together over the span of 22 years. Now, there is something rather unique about the prophecies of Ezekiel, and that is that his prophecies are dated. Now, there are other prophecies that are dated as well from you know, time to time in the Bible, but not so meticulously as Ezekiel, because Ezekiel gives us for each prophecy the day, the month, and the year. And there are other prophecies that also give us the same data, but Ezekiel's prophecies are systematically arranged in that way. And there are 13 separate ones, 13 separate dates, 13 separate you know, specific visions, 13 prophecies that Ezekiel was given by God. Now, in addition to that, he also subdivides some, but not all of those prophecies by certain statements. One such example is Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 1, where we see how Ezekiel subdivides a prophecy. Now, this is repeated many times. But before we read that example, let us read Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month of the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chebar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And then he describes what he sees and why, you know, what he is told by God. And when, uh, when we come to chapter 6, verse 1, he says, The word of the Lord 
came to me. Now, brethren, this sort of subdivides this particular prophecy. And then chapter 7, verse 1, there is another subdivision. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. As we will see as we go through the book, that, you know, there are numerous examples of that when we, he says that the word of the eternal or the word of the Lord came to him. That word Lord, by the way, is actually translation of uh, Hebrew Yahweh. So the word Yahweh came to him. Now, this could mean that he heard voices and God spoke to him. It could also have been that, but also when we look at the New Testament, we certainly find that Jesus Christ is the word there in the Greek rather than Hebrew, and the word in the New Testament is Logos. So Jesus Christ, he was the God of the Old Testament, and he was also called Word. Now it may mean that the word, Jesus Christ, who also is Yahweh, came personally to Ezekiel and spoke to him face to face. It may be that God spoke to him face to face in a vision. Or maybe, you know, just that words came to him. We don't know. And it doesn't really matter, brethren. There are things that we don't really have to know because all that we need to know, all that is relevant to us and our salvation is there recorded in the Bible. So whatever that phrase, the word of the Lord came to me means, it seems to be taking us into a different phase, a different subject, a different aspect of whatever he is covering at that particular point. Now the prophecies, these 13 prophecies are not all in chronological order. In other words, we don't start with a particular date and the next succeeding date and the next succeeding date all the way to the last. There are a few exceptions to that, but generally speaking, they follow a chronological pattern. We shouldn't bother much again about irregularities in the chronological pattern of his prophecies. It seems that Ezekiel has arranged some things according to subject matters rather than chronology. Now, we have mentioned that the house of Judah was in the process of going into captivity. You know, we said in the process because prior to the final fall of Jerusalem, there were, as I said, several deportations which took place over a 19 years period. So that is the time mostly when Ezekiel prophesied. Now, he also prophesied a few years beyond that time as well, but not a long time beyond that. But the house of Israel had gone into captivity about 721 before Christ. So if we consider that year when Israel went into captivity and the beginning of this prophecy, 593 before Christ, it was 128 years previous to the beginning of this book that Israel had gone into captivity. Now we all know that the house of Jacob, or the children of Jacob, which became a nation in Egypt, went into the wilderness went into the promised land, centuries later were divided during the time of Rehoboam and Jeroboam and became two separate nations. You know, they were two separate people. They had different national boundaries, they had different tribes, they had different government, different laws, different priesthood, almost different everything except that they all descended from Jacob and from his family. So when scholars and people who read the Bible read the book of Ezekiel today, you know, they think that the house of Jacob or the house of Israel or the house of Judah, that it is all one and the same people, that it is talking about the Jews. You know, everything in Ezekiel and other places, for that matter, whether it's talking about the house of Israel or the house of Judah, they think that it is talking about the same people. Now, brethren, I presume that all of us here realize that it is not so. I presume that we have understood, you know, what is the British Commonwealth and the United States in prophecy. That important teaching in the Church of God started as far as 1929 and it is one of the pivotal truths that God restored during the Philadelphia era of his church. And I'm convinced that one of the main problems that some Laodiceans have is the truth about Israel which they, like many Protestants in America and Britain, have labeled as racism. There is nothing racist about that, as I mentioned to you many, many times. It was in 1929 that Herbert Armstrong came to understand and began to preach the identity of the British Commonwealth and the United States. In his series of studies published for some, you know, for home studies in the 30s, which I shared with you, I think, several months ago. So in his series of studies, he even said, that the main key to understanding the Bible is to understand the identity of 
Israel. He understood, just as we understand today, that Manasseh and Ephraim are today America and Britain. Manasseh and Ephraim were sons of Joseph, who was the son of Jacob. And therefore, many of the prophecies in the book of Ezekiel relate to Britain and America and other Israelitish nations as contrasted or separate from the house of Judah. You know, it is impossible to jam all of these prophecies about the house of Israel and say that it is talking about the Jews who are now in the state of Israel. And yet, brethren, thousands of people, if not millions of people, are deceived to believe that. It obviously could not fit them, all those prophecies, because careful reading shows that there is so much to it and that the Jews, not by any stretch of imagination, could be the modern house of Israel. By the reasoning of these, those people, it would come you know, out that God had forgotten by the time of Ezekiel that over one century before that time, the nation of Israel had gone into captivity. And God had forgotten that those nations divided about 930 before Christ. That God had forgotten by the time of Ezekiel they had two capitals. That God had forgotten by the time of Ezekiel that there were two national boundaries, that there were different tribes, that there were sometimes, even according to Scripture, fighting with each other. The Jews, the house of Judah, fighting against Israel. So apparently, those people think that God had forgotten about all of that. So, you know, the first thing that we will read in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 37, starting with verse 15. And this is one of those sections that start with the words we have read a while ago. The word of the Lord came to me. So this is not the beginning of the prophecy. The beginning of the prophecy starts back several chapters in chapter 33, verse 21, which says in the 12th year of our exile, in the 10th month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has been struck down. Now that is the beginning of this specific prophecy, brethren. Then chapter 34, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me. Chapter 35, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me. And now chapter 36, verse 16, The word of the Lord came to me. Then on down to verse 15 of chapter 37, The word of the Lord came to me. Verse 16, Son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Now, what he's saying is that the Jews, tribe of Judah, had associated with them people who were considered as Jews, some of the children of Israel from other tribes. And if we look through the Bible history, we'll see that specifically a part, maybe all of the tribe of Simeon, might have been with them, a lot of the tribe of Levi as well, and also the tribe of Benjamin. But probably some of the other were mixed in there, brethren, because as the separate kingdom of Israel was formed, and as paganism became basically the national religion of the northern kingdom of Israel, many Israelite fugitives fled to the south into the kingdom of Judah because they did not want to follow the pagan ways. So there is no wonder that, you know, others... Israelites were mixed in there. Therefore, do not be confused when it says, For Judah and the people of Israel associated with him. Okay? And in the course of scattering, a few other Israelites, you know, uh, besides that, have also joined the house of Judah. So he is now saying, For Judah and the people of Israel who mixed in. And then he continues, says, And then take another stick and write on it, For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. Now, Joseph was one of the twelve sons of Jacob. And in the book of Genesis, we find that he received the double portion, one portion above his brethren, so that his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, became tribes in their own right. So for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, the younger brother, who became greater, and all the house of Israel associated with him. So we see with Joseph, who was two of the ten tribes, there were eight other tribes, and they were all, we see, the house of Israel. Israel. Verse 17. And join them one to another into one stick. So he says now, you write the name of Jew or Judah on one stick. You write the name of Joseph or Israel on the other stick, that they may become one in your hand. And now he just has one stick and on one end the name of Judah and on the other the name of Joseph or Israel. Verse 18. And when, you're, when your people say to you, Will you not tell us what you may mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, 
I am about to take the stick of Joseph that is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I'll join with it the stick of Judah and make them one stick that they may be one in my hand. Verse 21, Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'll take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. Back to the promised land. Verse 22, And I'll make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all, and they shall be no longer two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. Now, as we know, in the state of Israel today, there is, brethren, no one king. That state is not a monarchy. It is republic. They don't have a king. And we also see that they will no longer be two nations, nor divided into two kingdoms. Now, God inspired this because verse 15 says, The word of the Lord says this. And all that Ezekiel had to do was to write those words of God. And then he says that they are not going to continue in their sins. And then in verse 24, notice this, brethren, in verse 24, My servant David shall be king over them. So that is the king he mentions in verse 22. Now, David has been long dead. When is that God is going to raise up David? Well, at the first resurrection, at the last trumpet, at the return of Jesus Christ, at the beginning of the millennium. That is when David is going to be king, and when that happens, God is once again going to put those two nations which have been separated since about 930 before Christ. And finally, they're going to be one nation again. Let's read that again in verse 24. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall, be, they shall all have one shepherd. You know, they're going to obey me, he goes on to say, and David is going to be the prince forever. Verse 26, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. Verse 28, then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So we need to keep in mind that God remembers. Most people don't. That is the reason why we have gone over this section. Most people don't remember, but God remembers that they were two people, two geographic locations, two capitals, different tribes, different kings, different dynasties and kings, and so on. Now God knew that and knew that it was going to be that way right up till the very end. And there are a lot of people who don't know that, but, you know, if we are going to understand anything about the book of Ezekiel, we have to understand that, brethren. So the house of Israel and the house of Judah were two separate kingdoms, and they are to this day. They are separate people. They were one nation, then two nations, and then the ten tribes went away, and they became additional countries, additional nations. So the house of Israel and the house of Judah are to become one nation again under resurrected David at the beginning of the 1,000 years. But now this book was written during the time of Judah's fall. Not Israel's fall, but Judah's fall. And yet strangely, and this is something that we need to realize, the house of Judah is addressed or mentioned only about six times in the book. And there are more than 70 places where the house of Israel is mentioned. And there is one mention of the house of Jacob in the book of Ezekiel. So there are 10 times more references in the book of Ezekiel to the house of Israel than to the house of Judah. And yet they, the Israelites, had gone into captivity 128 years prior to the writing of the book. So from that it is very obvious that the emphasis is overwhelmingly on the house of Israel rather than on the house of Judah. But the things that were happening to Judah were actually events that were referred to from time to time and also then were used as types and references to what was going to happen to Israel. Let us now go to the beginning of the book. In chapter 1, we have the date of that particular prophecy. Again, we may not read all the Verses, of course, for the sake of time, but, you know, there is the date of that particular prophecy which came in 593 before Christ. You can jot that down in your Bible. 
you can write it on the margin of your Bible. But I mean, use the Bible as a textbook. It's not a holy book. The, what is written in the Bible is holy, but the book itself is not holy. It's not a holy object. It's not something to be revered. It is to be a textbook. So use it as such. At this particular time, Ezekiel and his former king, King Jehoiachin, had been into captivity in Babylon for five years. Now, this is the fifth year now of the exile of King Jehoiachin and also Ezekiel and others. First time we find it in this chapter are four living creatures described in very detail. We would probably like to figure out what was Ezekiel saying here. Sometimes it's a bit hard to understand what he means. Now, if we were there, perhaps we would sure have a lot more trouble than Ezekiel did trying to describe those fabulous creatures. One of them looks like an ox. You know, something there looks like a man and something else looked like an eagle and so on. So Ezekiel tries to describe this. And after he did that, it is still pretty hard to understand what he really described. So at the same, you know, and the same way with the wheels that are being described starting from verse 15. So uh, even though, you know, there may be some difficulties in understanding exactly what is he is describing we can picture it in our mind as best as we can and one day we'll see you know that what he described and we'll understand why he had such difficulty in putting those putting that all that in words what is ezekiel describing are four living creatures and over and above them there is a firmament or the more modern english word would be expanse in verse 22 is the beginning of that description and then above the expanse it looks like a platform looks like the sky as you see in verse 26 let's read verse 26 and above the expanse over their heads there was the likeness of a throne now we know what a throne is we may not know how this particular throne exactly looks like but it is some sort of a seat. He describes a little bit about that. And then, seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance, he says. And then he describes that human appearance, or as another translation says, human form. We can compare that to the 10th chapter and also to the first chapter in Revelation, which is describing Jesus Christ, the God of the Old Testament, the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Now let us notice here in the middle of verse 28, it says, Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So what he's describing here is Jesus Christ, who was also the God of the Old Testament, known in the Old Testament times as Yahweh. That is what Ezekiel sees here. Now he sits on the throne over an expanse, which is over these living creatures, cherubim or cherubim. And this is what we might call a portable throne. We might say it is the divine, th the divine throne or the throne of Jesus Christ. The throne of the Father is described elsewhere. And in there we find seraphims related to that particular throne. Do you realize the difference now, brethren? So this throne that we, Ezekiel saw was, you know, there were over, over these living creatures, cherubim, the throne of the Father is described elsewhere, and we find there seraphims related to Father's throne. So here are the cherubim related to the throne of Jesus Christ. So we see that fabulous throne over these creatures, such as we don't see on the earth, that can move instantly from place to place and head in a direction without even having to turn. And now he, this is speaking of Christ Yahweh, he says to Ezekiel that he's sending him to the people of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 3. And he said to me, son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, the nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. Nations in plural, brethren, today, as I said, there are various nations of Israelitish origin. They're basically located in Northwest Europe on the British Isles and in North America, as well as in Australia and New Zealand. And you see how they're described? The nations of rebels who have rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this day. Now the people of Israel include all 12 tribes. So he wasn't sent alone to the house of Israel, which were 10 tribes, or to the house of Judah, two tribes, but to all of them. He calls them rebels. In verse 4, 
He calls them impudent and stubborn and continues to mention them as being rebellious. Then starting in verse 8, he is told to take a scroll in which there were dire events mentioned and he says to eat them and he goes on to show that it would be as sweet as honey but it was going to taste bitter. A similar thing happened, you might remember, to the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. The words that Ezekiel was to give to the people of Israel are, we might say, bitter words. They seem to be good to start with, but they are very bad. Then in verse 1 of chapter 3, we notice it says, And go speak to the house of Israel. Now, brethren, here was Ezekiel in captivity. He couldn't go anywhere because he was in captivity, in slavery. And there is no record in this book that he ever went to the house of Israel. Now, the house of Israel had gone into captivity 130 years before this time. They had been taken up north of the Promised Land by the Assyrians to the vicinity of the Caspian Sea, Maybe some of them were still there, maybe some were gone, we don't know. The historical records of those times and those events are rather scarce, so we don't necessarily know the specifics of that, but probably some of them were still to the north and maybe some of them were gone. But Ezekiel couldn't go there, that is for sure. Because it was many, many, many days of journey to go there and there is no record that he ever went there. Now some of the elders of the house of Israel came to him on occasion and he spoke to the elders of, on some occasions and he also spoke to the elders of the house of Judah. Then in verse 4, against the eternal mentions, Son of man, go to the house of Israel. <coughs> verse 5, For you are not sent to a people of foreign speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Verse 7, But the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me, because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. So in verse 5 and verse 7, Ezekiel is told to go to the house of Israel. He is told twice in verse 7 to go to the house of Israel. Now, did God know who the house of Israel was? Of course he did, brethren. And what a ludicrous claim of today's modern history that the house of Israel is lost and we cannot locate it and find it. Of course that God knew, you know, who the house of Israel was. And Ezekiel also knew who the house of Israel was. It is just a lot of people today who don't know who the house of Israel was. Now verse 9 and verse 11. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you receive in your heart and hear with your ears. And go to the exiles, to your people, and speak to them, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear. But we have no records that Ezekiel, brethren, was ever able to do that. To go to the house of Israel and speak to them the words of eternal. That is a prophecy for today. So the same message that God gave Ezekiel to be written in the Bible could be preached in modern times to the descendants of Israel. Because really, a lot of those things that were happening back then are dual as far as the prophecy is concerned. And it is the important message for our time. In fact, it is more important now than it was at that time. And after he, has, you know, he had seen this vision, he writes in verse 15, And I came to the exiles at Tel Abib, who were dwelling by the Keber Canal, and I sat where they, they were dwelling, and I sat there overwhelmed among them seven days. <coughs> well, no wonder, brethren, what a fabulous vision he had. After seeing this fabulous vision, he probably sat there and didn't talk for seven days. Then at the end of seven days, verse 16, and at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Then it says in verse 17, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Now this phrase, I have made you a watchman, is repeated several times in the book. Then starting in verse 22, we find that he again sees this vision of the eternal. The glory of the eternal is mentioned in the middle of verse 23. Verse 22 says, And the hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said to me, Arise, go out into the valley, and there I'll speak with you. 
Verse 23, so I arose and went into the valley, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, and the glory that I had seen by the Chebar Canal, and I fell on my face. So now he is in the valley, by the plain, rather than by the canal, the irrigation canal of the river Chebar. And verse 24, and all the way we will lead this section, verse 24 through 27. Ezekiel says, But the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and he spoke with me and said to me, Go, shut yourself within your house. And you, O son of man, behold, cords will be placed upon you, and you shall be bound with them, so that you cannot go out among the people. And I'll make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth, so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I'll open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, He who will hear, let him hear, and he who will refuse to hear, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. And then we come to chapter 4, verse 1, And you, son of man, take a brick, and lay it before you, and engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem, and put siege works against it, and build a siege wall against it, and cast up a mound against it. Set camps also against it, and plant batteries, ramps against it all around. And you take an iron greedle, <coughs> and place it as an iron wall between you and the city. And set your face towards it, and let it be in a state of siege, and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side, and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it, for the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. For I assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of the years of their punishment, so long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. And we did indeed mention this, as you might remember, when we had a series of studies about the house of Israel, we brethren did mention these 390 days. We perhaps we need to go back and refresh some of our memories. In any case, we can just imagine how hard this would be. 390 days, brethren, that's over one year. Think about it. If you were laying on one side for a few minutes or over a night, you might become tired, as I do sometimes when my cats line up, you know, on the other side of the bed, and I, I just have to keep on my side, my right side. And I do remember how sometimes I, I get very quickly tired, brethren. And Ezekiel, you know, imagine that prophet, he was laying on one side without interruption for 390 days. Well, that, that is well over one year time. Now, there is a siege that Ezekiel is portraying. And at the end of verse 3, we have read that it says, This is a sign for the house of Israel. So he mentioned again in verse 4, Then lie on your left side and place the punishment on, of the house of Israel upon it. And then in verse 5, So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. So, brethren, the house of Israel... 390 days period and what he's portraying here is a siege to come on israel notice it says it was signed for the house for the entire house of israel brother never in the history of israel was the entire house of israel sieged assyrians did attack the northern tribes and they were taking israelites into captivity in several waves later 130 Years later, basically, there came the captivity of the Judah by the Babylonians, and it was, as we read, over this over a span of 19 years. So never was there a time that there was a siege which encompassed the entire house of Israel. So this is the prophecy of the soon future, brethren. This is prophecy for our time. Even if you think of the Jews, you know, even if one thinks that they are the house of Israel only, still there has never been a 390 day siege in their history. So this is again a prophecy for our time, brethren. Then he mentions the house of Judah in verse 6. And when you have completed these, you shall lie down a second time 
but on your right side and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. Forty days I assign you a day for each year. So he is now to lie on his right side for 40 days, showing that the house of Judah, the Jews, are going to be besieged for 40 days. In chapter 5, he goes on to describe it in details. In chapter 5, Ezekiel mentions the various thirds. Chapter 5, in verse 1 and 2. And you, O son of man, take a sharp sword. Use it as a barber's razor. You might remember we mentioned this barber's razor. That is the coming future king of Assyria, king of Germany, the coming European dictator. This is a duality in prophecy, brethren. What happened once will happen again, but the second time is going to be worse than the first time. Use it as a barber's razor and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take balances for weighing and divide the hair. A third part of, your, of you shall... Burn in the fire in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are completed and a third part you shall take and strike with the sword all around the city and a third part you shall scatter to the wind and I'll unsheath the sword after them. So we see in verse 2 that one third are going to be killed by the warfare during the siege that will come or the sword, and a third part is going to be scattered into the winds and will go into captivity, and then just a few of those are going to survive. And from Isaiah 6, 13 and Amos 3, apparently only 10% of the original figure are going to survive. Right? So let us read those, at least Isaiah 6, 13, to confirm how much of the house of Israel is going to survive the events that are here pictured. Isaiah 6, or Isaiah 6, verse 13, and though a tenth remain in it, it would be burned again like a terpinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Well, in Amos 3, I'll just read it, you don't have to go there. It's in verses 13 through 15. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I'll punish the altars of Beth El, and the horns of the altars shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I'll strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. But in Isaiah 6.13 we see a tenth part, brethren. That's exactly the indication in Ezekiel chapter 5 that one tenth of America and Britain is going to survive the coming great tribulation. Now in, we were in Ezekiel 5 verse 4 and of these again you shall take some and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. From there a fire will come out into all the house of Israel. Again brethren notice all the house of Israel never ever in the history of the house of Israel has it happened that the fire came to the entire house of Israel. A fire might have broken out in the you know, kingdom of Judah, but a different time uh, interval than in the kingdom of Israel. So therefore, we never had a fire that will come against the entire house of Israel. So we see all the house of Israel, all ten tribes. So the siege of Jerusalem actually represented what was going to happen to the house of Israel. Verse 5, thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem, I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her. So what we see here is this, brethren, because anciently Jerusalem was the capital of both Israel and Judah. It does represent the house of Israel and the house of Judah, at least in certain senses. Now let us come a little bit further to verse 9. And because of all your abominations, I'll do with you what I've never yet done and the like of which I will never do again. Now we need to note this carefully because it is very, very important. This was said in 593 before Christ. God says, this what I'm talking about, I have never done in the past. Now what is God talking about? Well, he's talking about the time of trouble that is going to come on Israel and Judah, such as never was in the past and never will be in the future. Now there is only one time in the history that this is going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. We read about that in uh, scriptures like Daniel 12, Jeremiah 30, and Joel 2. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. Alas, that day is so great that there is none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. 
or better said, brethren, Jacob, part of Jacob, remnant of Jacob, a 10% of Britain and America will be saved out of it. Daniel 12.1, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who was charged, who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Joel 2.2, 2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness there is spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. And I'm sure when I read all of this, you remembered that in Mark 13, verse 19, the words of Jesus Christ say, For in those days there will be such tribulation, as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. The same says in Matthew 24, 21, For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. So we have just read six scriptures, six verses, six places in the Bible that specifically refer to the time that has never been before, nor will it ever be be again. So we can see here in this prophecy in Ezekiel 5 the things that happened at that time were a type or a forerunner in a dual sense of what is going to happen in the end time. Then verse 12 Ezekiel mentions about a third again. A third part of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. A third part shall fall by the sword all around you and a third part I'll scatter to all the winds and will unsheath the sword after them. Let us now come to chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel. Now here it is again the beginning, or we might say it is a subdivision of this major prophecy. Now he describes the physical land of Israel and how it is going to become a waste. And yet, brethren, when we go back and read the descriptions of what happened at that time, we can find out that they were never destroyed. I mean, Israel was partly destroyed, but they were not totally destroyed. So this is talking about a later time. The house of Israel is mentioned again in verse 11. Thus says the Lord God, clap your hands and stamp your foot and say, Alas, because of all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. And in chapter 7, verse 1, we read, The word of the Lord came to me. So another subdivision of this particular section, it is talking about the total end of the land of Israel. Verse 2, And you, O son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end. The end has come upon four corners of the land. Verse 5, Thus says the Lord God, disaster after disaster behold it comes now verse 14 they have blown the trumpet and made everything ready but none goes to battle for my wrath is upon all their multitude well this of course is telling about the time leading up to the time of the great tribulation of the time of the great trouble verse 9 of chapter 5 but then brethren when the israelitish nations the house of israel is told that the war has come and they blow the trumpet that they go to war nobody is going to go to war and we can look around today and see uh, several possibilities of why that might happen then in verse 23 he talks about the land forge a chain for the land is full of bloody crimes and the city is full of violence verse 26 Disaster comes upon disaster. Rumor follows rumor. They seek a vision from the prophet while the law perishes from the priest and counsel from the elders. Well, there is more about that later, but the priests should preach the law, brethren. But they don't preach it today, do they? In the lands of Israel, do they preach the law? Do they preach the law in Canada and Australia, New Zealand and America? No, brethren. Do they preach it in England? No. They preach against the law. Now that is the end of the prophecy. The first prophecy of Ezekiel is given in the first seven chapters of the book. The summary of that prophecy is this. We saw one section about the throne of God. Then we saw a picture of the house of Israel, how they are rebellious and stubborn. Ezekiel was sent to be a watchman, which is surely a type of the one in the end time. He mentions about the siege that lasted 
390 and 40 days and Jerusalem was a type of Judah and Israel. Then the three thirds punishments, pestilence, war and captivity and how that God was going to ultimately bring destruction because of their idolatry and their sins. Now in many of sections of Ezekiel, especially in relation to Israel, we find the same thing repeated over and over and over again. The nation of Israel had sinned, therefore punishment comes, which includes captivity. Then the people repent and they are restored. And this is exactly the theme that is repeated, brethren, not in its entirety, but sometimes there is entirety of this which appears in all of these prophecies. Now we come to the second prophecy. This one was given about 592 before Christ. Chapter 8, verse 1. Again, we have the precise date. In the sixth year, in the sixth month of the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord fell upon me there. So now we see he's talking to the elders of Judah the elders of the house of Judah, not to the house of Judah, but to the elders of the house of Judah. And he describes the various abominations that he sees in vision in Jerusalem. In verse 6 we read, And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see still greater abominations. Now, don't get confused. Yes, he says, the house of Israel, brethren, the house of Judah is part of the house of Israel. Okay, all the Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. Okay, can we understand that? That's why it says the house of Israel, meaning that part of the house of, of Israel, the house of Judah, because he's sitting with the elders of Judah. So we see again the great abominations of the house of Israel are described here. Okay, exactly, because the house of Israel was, was committing exactly the same abominations as the house of Judah. So now he's talking to the elders of Judah. He sees things apparently taking place in Jerusalem, which was a part of Judah, not yet taken captive. And he says that the house of Israel is committing these things. So apparently then, and this is also dual, dual of our time, the same sin committed by Israel was committed by Judah. He mentions the various idols of the house of Israel. Then in verse 12, then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in dark, each in his room of pictures? For they say, the Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken the land. So now the elders of the house of Israel are doing similar things. Now he talks about every man in his room with pictures. I don't know what kind of pictures you know he is describing here. The Hebrew word for picture here is maskith. And it means a figure, it means a figure basically carved on, uh, carved on stone, the wall, or any object. So the word is maskith, the Hebrew word. Or brethren, figuratively, figuratively, it could, it you know, it means imagination, conceit, imagery. And when we look around the land today, there are, you know, TV sets, mobile phones and computers everywhere with plenty of pornographic and other pictures. So people of Israel are estranged from God putting their hearts and minds on wrong things. Now those technical appliances, of course, are certainly not wrong by themselves, but the wrong use of those certainly is. Then say in verse 12, for they say, the Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken the land. And that is better in the attitude of, that a lot of people have today as well. You know, that, you know, that are the same problems that we have today. People think that God is in his heaven and we are here on the earth. As long as he keeps his nose out of our business, let him do his business and we'll just do our own things and everything will be fine. But you know, God knows what is going on and God will intervene at the proper time. In verse 17, we notice the house of Judah is mentioned. He speaks about violence. And that as the result of that, God is not going to spare, but he is going to punish. And then he goes on to describe punishment to come. Then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations that they commit here, that they should fill the land with violence and provoke me still further to anger? Behold, they put the branch to their nose. You see, brethren, the punishment is described here uh, is in an allegory or a symbol. 
In chapter 9, we see in verse 4 that there is a man in a linen to go through Jerusalem, which is a type of the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Verse 4, And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. So we might say that the man was told to go through Israel and Judah and mark those who sigh and groan over all the abomination. Now most people are not concerned about abominations. They, they, don't, they don't even know what abominations are because you know they don't know the word of God. They don't know what is the abomination to God. So they may like or not like things that they think are abominable but have no idea what things are abominable to God. But those who know what is abominable to God and those that are concerned about it, they sigh and wish for God's kingdom to come because of all the wickedness they see around them. Those are marked and yet, you know, they are also protected and not killed. Let us notice verse 4, well, sorry, verse 9 that is. Then he said to me in verse 9, The guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. So what he's describing here that is happening in Jerusalem is going to happen to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the ten tribes and the two tribes. Then in chapter 11, uh, in verse, let's see, that will be verse 14. Chapter 11, verse 14 says, And the word of the Lord came to me. Now God's spirit, brethren, took Ezekiel to Jerusalem. So what he sees here is taking place in Jerusalem. Verse 15, Son of man, your brothers, meaning all those in exile, even your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, all of them are those of whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord, to us this land is given for a possession. What he is saying here is that the people who are left in Jerusalem are saying the Israelites have been taken into captivity. Many of our Jewish brethren are also taken into captivity. And here we are all left. And therefore, to those of us who are left, God has given us this land, the promised land. But brethren, then God goes on to say in verse 6, Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, Though I remove them far off, among the nations, and though I scatter them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. And in verse 17, Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come, they will remove all the detestable things and all the abominations. And then when he brings these people that have been scattered to the nations, verse 19 is rather important. It says, And I'll give them one heart and a new spirit, and I'll put and a new spirit I will put within them. I'll remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And what that spirit brethren would be? Well, it won't be the spirit of Satan, the devil, it will be the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people and I'll be their God. He's describing here things that will be taking place in the millennium, when God is going to restore Judah and Israel back to their land and, you know, they will become converted. And God mentions that over and over, he says that all Israel shall be saved. In chapter 12, we see the sort of analogy mentioned here. Ezekiel goes to the routine of an exile and how an exile has to leave his home and go into captivity. He speaks about the house of Judah and the house of Israel. He is saying in this chapter that what is going to happen to the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, and how he was going to go into captivity. Ezekiel 12 verse 10. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, this oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. And then in verse 28, God says he would no longer delay the fulfillment of those words. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord God. Chapter 13, here is another section to this second major prophecy. And he is saying here about the day of the Lord, what is going to happen to those prophets, to the religious leaders. 
Those prophets have misled people by telling them good things were going to come and preaching that they are going to have peace when that is not what was going to happen, brethren. He talks in this chapter about male and female prophets. In other words, he is speaking about the male and female preachers. And as you know, Protestant denominations today are filled with female preachers. You have them all over the place. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. So first came the elders of Judah, and now come the elders of Israel. And God says that these men have idols, and that they have not put away their idols. Verse 7 mentions the house of Israel. In verse 11, he says that there is going to come time that the house of Israel may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, declares the Lord God. And then he says that, you know, in the time of the great trouble that is coming, that even if Noah, Daniel and Job were in that particular place, that they, they would save their own lives, not even their own children. Then in chapter 15, we find Jerusalem described as a useless wine. Then in chapter 16, the word of the eternal came again. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. So the chapter talks about Jerusalem. It doesn't specifically say Israel, except maybe in type, but it is talking about Jerusalem this time. Verse 3, And say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth area of the land of the Canaanites, your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Well, Israel is not descended from those people, brethren, that's for sure, but Jerusalem was anciently inhabited by some of those people. It is talking about the city primarily as a type of the nations. He talks about you know, how Jerusalem was befriended and protected by God. And when the time came for marriage, she was married to God and how God blessed her with all good physical things. Then he says how Jerusalem exchanged the good things God has given her for the worship of other gods. He also mentions in, the, in this chapter Sodom and Samaria, neighboring cities of ancient Jerusalem, and how now Jerusalem had seen even worse than Sodom and worse than Samaria. And if we wonder what the sin was in the land of Sodom, we can look about that in verses 49 and 50. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, access of food, and prosperous ease but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Well, these two verses, brethren, add a bit to what we read in Genesis. Then in verse 53, I will restore their fortunes, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters, and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters, and I will restore your own fortunes in their midst. Now he's talking about three cities. Jerusalem, Sodom, and Samaria. Verse 54. That you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done, becoming a consolation to them. As for your sisters, Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state, and you and your daughters shall return to your former state. What is not talking about here? Well, what is he really talking about here is the second resurrection, brethren. He is talking about the great white throne judgment day. And when ancient Sodom and all their people who died in the ancient plague, you know, will be resurrected, and then all those people will return to their former estate. And as it says in succeeding verses, they are going to learn. God's ways. We are going to read now verse 62 and 63. I'll establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded, and never open your mouth again because of your shame, when I atone for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord God. Chapter 17, then there is an allegory here of the house of Israel, starting in verse 11. We find here some comments about the king of Babylon coming against Jerusalem and his relationship with, with the king. Chapter 18, I'll just point out what is said twice in that chapter, brethren, the well-known verse, the soul which sins shall die. So the children will not die for the sins of their parents and vice versa. In verse 25, people were saying that God was unfair 
Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. God tells them, Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? But God is fair, brethren. Verse 30, Therefore I'll judge you, O house of Israel. This is mentioned several times in this chapter. Everyone according to his ways declares the Lord God, Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Verse 31, Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. And of course, that is what is going to happen, as we know, in the millennium and after the millennium in the great uh, white great throne judgment period. Then there is a lamentation in chapter 19 over the princes or the kings of Israel. And we might say in the sense of the princes of, or kings of Judah as well. Those are chapters in this particular second prophecy. The third prophecy, starting in chapter 20, came about 589 before Christ. And again, <coughs> the elders of Israel are involved, verse 1 and verse 2. And in verse 5, Ezekiel mentions the house of Jacob, which includes all 12 tribes. Now, this chapter is a marvelous chapter because it describes from God's point of view the history of Israel and Judah and how God dealt with them, how he gave them his laws, how he gave them his holy days, how he gave them his Sabbath, and then he turns from them and what is going to happen. That's what this chapter is telling us about. And we often quote it when we speak about the transgressions of the house of Israel. And then after they have gone into captivity, verse 37, I'll make you pass under the rod and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant. Well, brethren, this happened year by year when they separated tithes of their herds and flocks. So, you know, he's saying only 10%, again, reinforcing what we know from chapter 5. Only 10% are going to survive the great tribulation and the coming captivity of the house of Israel. <coughs> Verse 40. From my holy mountain, the mountain of height of Israel, declares the Lord God, there are there all the house of Israel, all of them shall serve me in the land. There I'll accept them, and there I will require your contributions and the choicest of your gifts with all your sacred offerings. Verse 42. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers. Now that last statement, you know, is repeated many times in this book and in the major theme. It is the major theme of the book. When these things come to pass, the people will know who the true God is. Verse 43. And there you shall remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves and you shall loathe yourselves for all the evils that you have committed. So we find again not only what will happen to the house of Israel before the millennium but also what will happen to it when the millennium comes. You know the house of Judah is going to be serving God. Those horrible things end up with what is described in Revelation 20, when Israel is going to serve God and know God's ways. Chapter 21. The word of the Lord came to me again. Another prophecy is here, brethren. There is another one in verse 18. Chapter 22. Has several sections. The word of the Lord came to me. It also speaks again about the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And then chapter 23 ends that particular prophecy. Chapter 24 starts the fourth prophecy. On that particular day that is mentioned here, the king of Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem. And there is an allegory that is mentioned here again, a personal note here in verse 15 through 18, Ezekiel's wife dies. Then in chapter 25, he is telling what is going to happen to Ammonites because of what they do to the house of Judah. Now this is a rather unique chapter in which the house of Judah is mentioned in verse 3, 8 and 12. So three times the house of Judah is mentioned. Verse 3, verse 8, verse 12. And after reading about the house of Israel, now the house of Judah is emphasized. And they, of course, were in the land of Israel. So he is first saying to Ammonites, then in verse 8 to Moabites, then in verse 12 to Edomites, and in verse 15 to Philistines, what is going to happen to them for what they do to the house of Judah. In other words, he is describing things in our time what these nations round about Jews are going to do to the Jews, and then God is going to punish these nations for what they have done. 
that is the end of that prophecy now chapter 26 is another prophecy refers to Tyre and there is a duality there there is also a very important passage relating to Satan who is the head of the entire system of Tyre there is an ancient city of Tyre and there is a modern counterpart then the sixth prophecy starting in chapter 29 relates to Egypt it starts in verse 17 that is the last prophecy chronologically in the book of Ezekiel the eighth prophecy starts in chapter 30 verse 20 it relates again to Egypt now the ninth one relates to Egypt starting in chapter 31 and the tenth one chapter 32 verse 1 again relates to Egypt then brethren in chapter 32 verse 17 and all the way to chapter 33 verse 20 it tells about various gentile nations and their armies and what is going to happen to them they'll go to sheol or to the grave and it also concludes again with the duty of a watchman now we have come to chapter 33 verse 21 in the twelfth year of your of our exile in the tenth month on the fifth day of the month a fugitive from jerusalem came to me and said the city has been struck down now this was a few weeks after the city had fallen and the word about it reached Ezekiel. Earlier we find the words of God that the siege came to the city and now the word has come that the city has fallen. And that starts the twelfth prophecy of this particular book which covers also the 37th chapter. Now chapter 40 is the last prophecy, 13th prophecy. And this prophecy takes place 12 years after the previous prophecy so there was a long period in which ezekiel didn't receive any prophecy or if he, if, if he even got any brethren it is not recorded in the bible so this prophecy gives in general detail the physical aspects of millennial temple and of course the temple that will be on the earth during the period of the great white throne judgment now not only is the temple described in great detail but also the priesthood or the Levites and the division of the land because again God is going to bring the remnant of God's pe of his people Israel back to their land and he's going to divide the land up between the tribes now most of these prophecies are about the house of Israel and the house of Judah most of the prophecies related to Israel involve similar things you know sin of Israel and Judah the punishment that automatically is going to come which ends in captivity and then restoration this theme is repeated over and over again in these particular prophecies.